How to be a real artist. Now, there is no one way to be artistic or one way to create art. In today's musical landscape, there aren't many real artists out there in my opinion, as we are in the age of the performer, the entertainer's era. Anyone can be an entertainer, but not everyone can be a true artist. And that brings us to Kate Bush. Kate Bush is a timeless piece in music. She pushed the boundaries of what is acceptable for a popular female artist in her time and has influenced some of the biggest names in music today. Kate Bush taught us how to make it about the art first, compromising only when absolutely necessary, and she laid down the blueprint on how to be a real artist. In 1958, Elvis Presley was drafted into the US military, Madonna and Michael Jackson were born, and so was Kate Bush. Born Catherine Bush in Bexley Heath, Kent, England, to parents in the medical field, who had an artistic background. Her mother was a traditional amateur Irish dancer, and her father was an amateur pianist. While her brothers were into folk music, teeming with creativity around her, Bush taught herself how to play the piano at age 11. At a young age, Kate Bush also played the organ in a barn behind her parents' house and studied the violin, and she would write her own songs. Now, these writing sessions weren't professional at all, however, it was a step in the right direction in becoming a world-renowned artist. Trying to get signed as a teenager, Kate's demo tape with around 50 songs were sent to a number of labels, but they all rejected it. Ricky Hopper, a friend of Kate's brother John, he had connections in the music industry and he tried to circulate Kate's demo to no avail. Ricky would then convince Dave Gilmore, guitarist from Pink Floyd, to listen to the tape. Dave was impressed by the demo, but the demo was rough and unprofessionally produced. Dave took a chance on Kate and helped the singer by using his own funds to record three tracks produced by Andrew Powell and sound engineer Geoff Emmerich, who had worked with the Beatles. The tape was then sent to EMI, who signed Kate at age 16, but Kate was young, so she was put on retainer for two years by Bob Mercier, managing director of EMI's group, Repertoire Division. And you were what age then? About 16? Yes. But the company then asked you, as I understand it, to sort of go, go away and, and write more and develop your voice, and they didn't at that stage want to release a song by you? No, that's not quite true. They didn't tell me to go away. Um, I signed the contract and there was just feelings that we weren't sure how to handle it. I mean, I myself felt that I was very young at that time and not capable of handling the business. I didn't know anything about it. And I think they were also worried that I was too young and that they were looking on it as a long-term project and that they wanted to give me time. And uh, I just used the time. I wasn't told to go and do anything. Kate Bush received a large advance from EMI. She would use some of the funds to enroll in interpretive dance classes and mime training in 1978. At the age of 19, Bush released her debut studio album, The Kick Inside. For its debut single, EMI wanted to release James and the Cold Gun. As at the time, in the late 70s, progressive rock was very popular in the English music scene, but Kate pushed back at the label's decision for the more art, gothic pop, Weathering Heights. His song I love. On the track, Kate's voice is comfortably high-pitched as she gets into character. Inspired by the novel of the same name, she was inspired after seeing the 1967's BBC adaptation late at night in 1977. Weathering Heights is sung from the perspective of the Weathering Heights character, Catherine Earnshaw, pleading at Heathcliff window to be allowed in. Now, Kate Bush was just hopeful audiences would just like the song, but little did Kate know she had a hit on her hands. Weathering Heights entered the UK singles chart where it quickly rose to the number one spot, knocking off the competition Take a Chance on Me, a song by ABBA. Honey, I'm still free. Take a chance on me. The track was certified platinum by the BPI, selling over 600,000 copies. With Kate Bush credited as the only songwriter, this marked the first time a British female singer-songwriter 
topped the chart with a self-penned song. The Kick Inside received widespread acclaim from critics and the public, peaking number three in the UK and selling over one million copies, propelling Kate's image and making her a star in the UK. The project saw lesser success in the US as there wasn't a place for Kate's music on US radio and there wasn't any major outlets for Kate's music videos, but that would soon change due to the rise of MTV in the 80s. It said her label EMI promoted her with a more sexual appearance, trying to capitalize on her looks by promoting the album with a poster of her in a tight pink top which emphasized her breast. In an interview with NME in 1982, Bush criticized the choice saying, People weren't even generally aware that I wrote my songs or played the piano. The media just promoted me as a female body. It was like I've had to prove that I'm an artist in a female body. Due to the success of Kate's debut album, EMI rushed the release of her sophomore project, Lionheart, released the same year. A more art rock venture. The project received mainly average scores from the critics, some calling the album dull and inferior to her debut, and I too think the album is a bit bland. Even Kate herself admitted the album needed more time. The leading single, Hammer Horror, would underperform, peaking at number 44 on the UK singles chart. The second single, Wow, peaked number 14, and the third single, Symphony in Blue would miss the UK singles chart altogether. Despite two of the singles' poor performance, Lionheart was certified platinum by the BPI, shipping 300,000 copies. The third album, Never Forever, released in 1980, had better performing singles, Breathing and Army Dreamers, both reached number 16 in the UK, while Babushka, a song about a husband having a secret affair with unknowingly his wife, Babushka, peaked at number 5 in the UK. The song is entertaining as hell, and Kate painted the picture perfectly with the precise storytelling. Despite peaking number 1, becoming Kate Bush's first number 1 album, and was also the first album by a British female solo artist to top the UK albums chart, as well as being the first album by any female solo artist to enter the chart number 1, Never Forever would have lower sales than her second album, barely passing the 100,000 mark. Her fourth studio project, The Dreaming, released in 1982, where Bush took complete control, being listed as the only producer, which is very impressive. She utilized Fairlight CMI Digital Sampling Synthesizer, which she had first used on Never Forever, but again, continued the downward commercial spiral for Kate Bush, as The Dreaming sold less than 100,000 copies, making it evident she was now a flop on the EMI roster. One of her most ambitious works, The Dreaming, initially received mixed reviews, but in retrospect, the album received praise for its experimentation, but again, at the time of release, people didn't get it. Kate would then exclude herself from the eyes of the public. With Kate's first four albums, they were recorded in busy London, and although the energy of a buzzing city can help with productivity, it can also become a distraction for creative artists like Kate Bush, or any kind of artist for that matter. In addition to being distracted, recording in the studios in London would be costly, and her albums weren't flying off the shelves. What's the point of wasting time and money in an industry where time and money is everything. In the production of her fifth studio album, Hounds of Love, the album that would renew her career as an icon, Kate Bush left the city and moved to the countryside. She built her studio in a barn behind her family home, a former farmhouse in East Wickham Farm, Welling. The lead single, Running Up That Hill, was the first track composed from Hounds of Love, written solely by Kate, shrouded in new wave. Running Up That Hill, a Deal With God is a song about the complications of being in a relationship, partners switching bodies literally to understand each other. A 
originally titled A Deal with God, Iomai would suggest to Kate and later convince her to change the title to Running Up That Hill, as they feared the song wouldn't play on radio in more religious countries. Upon release, the song proved to be a commercial success for Kate. The track peaked number 3 in the UK and number 30 on the US Billboard Hot 100. Then, in 2022 after the song was featured, at a pivotal moment in Netflix Stranger Things, SPOILER! The part where Max was running from that dirty, nasty, he must be musty, Vecna's bitch ass, we saw Kate running up that hill on the charts again, 37 years after its original release, re-entering the UK singles chart, peaking number 1 and peaking number 3 on the US Billboard Hot 100, proving to be a timeless bop. And if I hadn't made it clear, Kate Bush both wrote and produced all the songs on the album. So best believe Homegirl is making bank to this day. Kate Bush owns her masters for all her recordings including the entire recording copyright to Running Up That Hill. Hounds of Love was released on September 16, 1985, a three-year gap since The Dreaming. By that time, Madonna was center stage with a more sexual image, making shockwaves and dominating music with more risky behaviors. And if you think the public would be less interested in Kate, you would be so wrong. Hounds of Love debuted atop the UK album chart dethroning Madonna's Like a Virgin and has been certified double platinum in the UK. Hounds of Love is compressed into two sides of ambiguity, massive and introspective songs. Side 2 subtitled The Ninth Wave, a concept piece about a woman drifting alone at sea at night, taking us through death and rebirth. It's in the trees! It's coming! How to be a real artist. There's really no one way. By analyzing Kay Bush's career, it's about being true to who you are as a person and an artist. It's about diving deep into your work, producing a body of work that means something, understanding the process of creating, being more than a performer, and ownership. How many artists we see today releasing soulless music and signing 360 deals? You can tell they aren't artistic at all. But hey, it's okay for them, so I guess it's okay for me, but Kate Bush has proven it's also okay to be real. Thank you so much for watching this video, tell me what you think about it in the comments section and tell me if you have any suggestions of who you want me to cover next. I am Don, your pop culture boy, your pop culture boy, your pop culture boy, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.